and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable about the need to pray continually and never lose heart. There was a judge in a certain town, he said, who had neither fear of God nor respect for man. In the same town there was a widow who kept on coming to him and saying, I want justice from you against my enemy. For a long time he refused, but at last he said to himself, Maybe I have neither fear of God nor respect for man. But since she keeps pestering me, I must give this widow her just rights, or she will persist in coming and worry me to death. And the Lord said, You notice what the just, unjust judge has to say? Now, will not God see justice done to the, his chosen who cry to him day and night, even when he delays to help them? I promise you he will see justice done to them, and done speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God's family, dear brothers and sisters, we are pilgrim people. We call pilgrims people who, out of devotion, go to certain places or shrines particularly revered for some particular intervention of God there, like some apparition in the past, miracles being worked and so on. In the past, people went on pilgrimage to the Holy Land to venerate the places where our Lord Jesus Christ lived and died, or to Rome to visit the tombs of the apostles Peter and Paul, the catacombs where the early Christians who died for their faith are buried, and so on. People still flock to the Holy Land and to Rome, in modern times, they also go on pilgrimages to various shrines of Our Lady, like Luz, Fatima, and in Kenya to Subukia or Komarok. Pilgrims in the past involved far more pilgrimages. Sorry, pilgrimages in the past involved far more hardships and risks than they do nowadays. They were normally undertaken on foot the pilgrims begging their food all long, along the way. The title pilgrim suits the church perfectly. Christians are a people always on the move, always on their way towards the holiest shrine that can be imagined, namely heaven, where we shall live with God forever. Millions among the members of the church have already reached their destination, Others are reaching there at this very moment. Some are starting the journey just today as they are being baptized, while we find ourselves at various stages of the journey. Yet on our way to heaven, none of us walks independently from the rest, though no two of us find ourselves at exactly the same point in the journey, God wants us to walk together as a family, as his people that we are, just as our ancestors took good care to move as a single tribe until they reached the place uh, or where, they, they, where they went on to occupy. Where anyone to insist on reaching heaven all by himself, independently of the Christian community, he would never reach the goal. There is no particular or better symbol of our present situation as pilgrims on our way to heaven than the people of Israel on their way through their desert from Egypt to the promised land. Baptism was for us what the crossing of the Red Sea had been for the people of Israel, a breaking away from slavery, for them the slavery of Egypt, for us the slavery of sin. Moses was their leader. Our leader is Christ. In his gospel, Matthew presents Christ as the second Moses and the church as the new people of Israel. As today's first reading shows, 
the Israelites on their way to the promised land met with powerful enemies. However, their most dangerous enemy was their own pride, when, which often led them to refuse obedience to Moses. The same enemy plays havoc also among us. We too, time and again, refuse to follow Christ. The promised land was the goal of the Israelites. Ours is heaven, a land where truly milk and honey flow, a promise to us, the land promised to us by Christ. The church has today an important advice to offer so that we may safely reach home. Many and powerful enemies are trying to prevent the Christian community from reaching its destination. We need a powerful weapon to overcome those enemies, and we have it, the weapon of prayer. The tribe of the Amalekites, a fierce tribe, blocked the Israelites' way into the Promised Land. Actually, they were the relatives of the Israelites since they descended from Esau, the elder brother of Jacob. But they proved a permanent enemy to Israelites for centuries. They were still so at the time of David uh, and Saul 300 years later. Moses ordered Joshua, his commander, to gather his warriors and give battle to the Amalekites. He would contribute to their victory with his prayer. So he went up to a hill, extended his arms in prayer, holding the staff of God in his right hand. Thus, this staff had become a symbol of God's power. On the mountain, Moses lifted up the staff to recall the Israelites that God's power was with them. He would intercede with God in their favor. How decisive was Moses' favor prayer can be made out from the fact that as long as he prayed, the battle went in Israel's favor, while the Amalekites got the upper hand the moment he stopped praying. Hence the device of Aaron and Hur to keep Moses' arms permanently raised in prayer when he got tired, until at sunset the Amalekites were put to rout. The lessons we are invited to draw from this event in the history of the people of Israel are clear. Prayer is a powerful weapon to overcome enemies, preventing us from reaching the promised land. Prayer must last as long as battle lasts, until sunset, that is, to the end of our life. We must pray until the very end of our life. Thirdly, victory is the result of a combination of action and prayer, of our efforts and God's help. We all must be a combination of Moses and Joshua, remembering that all our efforts to be saved must become a prayer, relying on God's help rather than on our own strength. In our Sunday homilies this year, we have often said that Luke wrote his gospel to boost the courage of a group of Christian communities who felt disheartened on account of persecution. They had been eagerly waiting for the second coming of Christ to end their trials. But tired of waiting, they started doubting and wondered, might the Lord be coming at all? Luke pointed out at the reason for their discouragement and their wavering in their faith, that is, their prayer was not what it should be. Their prayer was not what it should be. To drive home his lesson, Luke made use of the parable of the unjust judge and the nagging widow, which Jesus had narrated precisely for situations like that of the Christians. They had no reason to be discouraged uh, for the judge, though a wicked man who did not care a bit for justice, granted what the widow asked, if only to get rid of his importunity. Secondly, God instead is all goodness and loves his children when he warns, uh, whom he warns in heaven. Is he likely to turn a deaf ear to their prayer? So, St. Luke is saying, let them gather courage. 
Christ's apparent delay in coming was meant to help them increase their trust in him. They should not entertain doubts. He would certainly, definitely come to take them home. We can see for ourselves reflected like in a mirror in the situation of the communities for which Luke wrote his gospel. We ourselves are reflected. We easily get discouraged. Our faith in Christ grows weak. And as a consequence, our life gradually becomes a poor, colorless Christian life. The causes for discouragement are many. The first is a temptation or the temptations. Temptation drags us down into sin time and again. From time to time, serious scandals take place within our community and we are shocked at the sins of some of our leaders. Secondly, we are disunited. Disagreements among us follow one another. We do not feel the enthusiasm we once felt to bring people to Christ. Thirdly, our Sunday service may be poorly attended and poorly conducted. And we might wonder, what has gone wrong with us? If we examine things well, we shall find that the basic cause of our troubles among us is that we pray little or we pray badly. We pray little and we pray badly. Let each one therefore reflect on how much time he set aside daily for prayer, either individually or in the community. And then we do pray from time to time, but we might be praying uh, or limiting our prayer to formulas, good in themselves, but which we recite without putting our heart and soul into them. That is, we can say we know certain prayers, but we have to confess that we hardly know how to pray. And this is serious because, on the one hand, faith in Jesus cannot stand without authentic prayer. While prayer without faith becomes meaningless, prayer and faith go together. They sustain each other. Today's second reading, like that of the last two Sundays, is taken from the second letter of St. Paul to his, Timothy, to his disciple Timothy. Paul is well aware of the difficulties which Christian life entails and warns Timothy of dangers ahead. You are well aware that anybody who tries to live in devotion to Christ is certain to be attacked. Uh, is certain to be attacked. Paul recalls Timothy how, from his early childhood, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, uh, their father was a pagan, had instructed him in the scriptures. He now invites him to turn to the scriptures always more assiduously, both in, in his prayer and in his teaching. The scriptures are the sunset way, are the surest way, scriptures are the surest way to learn of God's plans for us and to help others find God's plans for them. They are good to help. Scriptures are good to help us see our own mistakes and to help others correct theirs. Scriptures are an excellent guide to holiness in life for us and for others. In short, St. Paul tells Timothy, you can learn from the scriptures the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Are not precisely these the very aims of prayer as taught by Jesus in the gospel? We must confess that in the past we have made little use of the scriptures in our prayer and that may account for the feebleness of our prayer life. It is not a question of throwing overboard formulas we learned as children, but of putting new life into them through the Holy Scriptures. Whenever we pray, we should allow God to speak first. Certainly it is far more important what God has to say than what we might tell Him. We should start by asking God to speak to us and to tell us know His loving plans on our regard and to let us see in what we might have gone against them. It is after listening to God that our response will be meaningful. Uh, it is then we should thank Him for His boundless love, express our sorrow for our sins, and ask for His help in confidence, to walk in line with His plans uh, to save us. Each time when we approach God in prayer, 
we receive from him a fresh reassurance. Gather courage. In spite of obstacles within and without, I will see to it that you safely reach home, that you are saved. So we pray, Father in heaven, let your spirit lead us in prayer that putting our trust in you, we may overcome the enemies of our salvation and reach safely our home in heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Jesus, we believe in Jesus, philosophy. 